Jerry Purnell died today. Now most of you, I'm assuming, will have never heard of Jerry Purnell, which is sort of a shame. When I went into the service in the Army in the 19, late 1970s, there was a battle going on in what, how the Army should be focused. There were two arguments. There was the argument to make simple, reliable, cheap weapons. This is what Russia was doing at the time, or the Soviet Union, let's be, let's be precise. So the AK-47 is a simple, reliable, cheap weapon that doesn't take a lot of training to use. We're seeing the result of that. It's spread throughout the world. On the other hand, there was an, another argument that was headed by Jerry Purnell. And he wrote a book called The Strategy of Technology. And that was ended up being used at the at West Point, at the Air Force Academy, and the National War College. His argument was that you wanted smarter weapons. You wanted the technology in your weaponry. That dumb weapons were in the past and smart weapons are the future. Well, Jerry Purnell won the battle over the time. Today we see our military, they've got light night vision goggles which is which are complicated beasts let's be honest you have to have the technology to make them our weapon systems everything from the our bombers to our tanks to everything we have are relatively complex they're based upon technology they're not the simple reliable cheap weapons like the AK-47 now We've proven at this point in time through the Gulf Wars that we, the technology works. Technology has a major multiplier effect in the battlefield. But there was a battle going on in the late 70s and early 80s. And Jerry Purnell was one of the major leaders in that. He was in there. You also take a look at what's happening with SpaceX and Blue Origin. Now, SpaceX sees all the, get, gets a lot of the press and they get a lot of the contracts. <coughs> but Blue Origin, you can almost argue, comes out of what was called the DX project. Jerry Purnell pushed really hard to start up what was called the X project and they built a, it was the first rocket to take off and land on its on a thing of fire that's the phrase on a tail of fire that goes back to imagery from Heinlein who is there now I remember Jerry Purnell vividly he was when I was going to the world science fiction conventions he was a bigger than life image he's a tall man and he spoke very loudly he was partially deaf. He had lost part of his hearing in the Korean War. And like many people who have a little bit of hearing impairment, they tend to speak loudly. And Jerry Purnell would speak extremely loudly, never needed a microphone, until I guess later in life. But he was a interesting character, fascinating speaker, came up with some brilliant ideas. I'm reading through something that uh, on Instant Pundit, I think it is, or whatever. One of the other things he came up with, which we never implemented, which was a shame, was that they, uh, was Project Thor. And the idea was really simple, and it was actually proposed that we do this with a space shuttle. Project Thor, you get some iron rods. I can't remember exactly the dimensions, and I didn't bother to look it up, but I think they said you needed them about um, two to three inches in diameter, about 10 feet long. <coughs> Simple, easy to obtain, cheap iron rods. Well, what happens is at the end of the iron rod, you put a, a deburn booster, a booster rocket engine just large enough to to deorbit 
this, what, this iron rod from orbit. And then you put some guidance with it too. And the whole thing, you, wrap, you bundle it up and you put in some foam chart, foam packets, packages of, of the liquid that will, ex when exposed to vacuum, will become a foam. So you, the idea was you'd bundle this up, put it, throw it in the shuttle, it's just spare, spare cargo, when you have spare cargo space. Then you kick it out into orbit. Now what happens as soon as you launch it into orbit the, from the shuttle, the foam would, it, you'd explode the foam charges and they would cover the whole thing in foam. This makes it hardened. You can't take one of these things out because it's just, just a big blob of foam. Now what happens is that when you wanted to use Project Thor, they were also known as uh, hypervelocity rod bundles or um, rods from God or lightning bolts from God was, was sort of the, the, the or lightning bolts from Thor that um, you would deep that you would burst the foam possibly with a small charge or it didn't really matter you could actually try and re-enter with the foam it didn't matter because it burn off the rods had to be, I think it was at least 10 feet long because they, you would deorbit them and they would come down at the steepest possible re-entry, which means they're coming in like a meteor, but they've got a little bit of directional capability so you can direct them where you want them. These things come through and I think the numbers that were there with a 10 foot long rod five feet of it would burn away re-entering. So you only got a five foot rod coming in with a tremendous kinetic energy, a lot of power. Somebody argued you could do this against a nuclear silo and the rods would penetrate the six to 12 feet of reinforced concrete because they're that, they're that fast. And they said, you put a bundle of these of say 10 to 20, and you see tanks in the open like we saw in the Gulf War, you, these things would probably take out tanks. Actually, the problem that you would probably have with the press was they would freak out, is they would probably put up a mushroom cloud because of just the kinetic energy. And there's, we won't, there's the whole physics of why there's a mushroom cloud. But this was one of Jared Purnell's ideas. He was pushing for this. Um, he was a staunch advocate of space. He was an advisor to Dan Quayle. I know that he talked about Dan Quayle and some things like that, who was vice president at the time. And he was a, an interesting speaker. He, some of his um, best known works are Footfall and uh, Lucifer's Hammer. Lucifer's Hammer is amazing. If you haven't read Lucifer's Hammer, you ought to read Lucifer's Hammer. Not sure how well it holds up to time because it might be just a tiny bit dated, but it was quite good because it was, it was written, it's post-apocalyptic where we get hit by a comet. <coughs> but he was, uh, he also wrote a bunch of other books and I'll leave those for you to look up. But it's a shame he passed away. Um, he was um, a very colorful character. There was called the, the the phrase was Pornelling, which last time I was to a convention nobody even knew what it was. They Jerry Purnell would often go to at the conventions, world science fiction conventions and so on, he would sit in the audience and then would talk back to the to the panel and would often get into debates and then would actually just barge up to the panel and join the panel. It, yeah, he, he would join panels that he wasn't invited to. Uh but he was very colorful. He was a, a great thinker, a true patriot. And the interesting, the interesting phrase, I was looking to see if I could find anything about it. The first time I ever heard the term libertarian was from Purnell. Because they were trying to argue, they weren't happy with the Democrats, they weren't, ha him and some others, weren't happy with the concept of the Republicans, with what they were, what they were fighting for. They didn't particularly like um, what Reagan had brought in the religious aspect into the um, Republican Party. So he was the one who 
he was the one who introduced me to the, liber the phrase libertarian because Purnell became basically a libertarian. He was heavily involved with the Republican Party and, and running a bunch of things, but he was also uh, a very free thinker. And he uh, made, uh, made it easy to understand, and it was the first time I saw, drew, saw the diagram, which we see today, the, the two-axis diagram. Now, did he create that? I don't know. Where did he get it from? I'm not sure. I remember there was uh, one of the th so one of the things that got ar arguing about was um, he had a debate with someone about that we should sell the army. Yeah, there there were some interesting debates. He ran. He didn't want to call it a blog. It actually predated the phrase blog, which was Chaos Manor, um, which was goes back to Byte Magazine and and so on. He was been around. He will be missed. Uh, it's a it's a shame. I don't know of anybody today who's as deeply involved with space as and with government and the military. It doesn't mean there isn't somebody. I just don't know them. But Pornell was uh, a um, bigger than life character. I think he was six foot three. He was he was a very tall man, and. He, yeah, and th there were interesting arguments about the him and Harlan Ellison had some tremendous confrontations with each other is the best phrase, and I, I remember uh, Purnell said yes that it when it got heated that Ellison would uh, degenerate into into profanity before uh, Purnell would, and Purnell was totally politically incorrect. Oh. Today, you could have, I remember at a World Science Fiction Convention, him reading um, Gunga Din, Rudyard Kipling's Gunga Din, and he didn't censor it. He actually used what Kipling, he actually read what Kipling wrote, which today would just cause nightmares, and I'll leave that for you to, to take a look. Gunga Din is a great poem and uh, people will say, oh, it's racist because it uses the N-word. It does, just like Huckleberry Finn uses the N-word. But I remember Jerry Purnell getting up and reading Gunga Din at, at one fray, at one reading or something I w attended that he was there. And uh, that was uh, an interesting, I will miss him. So just thought I'd tell you a little bit of my hit remembrances of Jerry Purnell. Thank you.